Good evening, Chief Justice, and thank you very much um, for coming through. You did, of course, raise eyebrows last week when presenting uh, your report to disclose that you had been offered a sum of about 600 uh, million um, rands by some person or persons you, of course, wouldn't uh, tell us who you wouldn't want to name. Well, I've been asked about it um, by a few journalists, and all I'm prepared to say is it was not directly to me. It was through somebody that I respect highly, that I believe meant well, and uh, from an individual through a particular structure, but that individual is based in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, was it for? Court modernization. Mm -hmm. And what then was the basis uh, for your rejection of the offer? Anybody who wants to support a government department ought to inquire or to know what are the channels through which state institutions are, are funded. And two, um, it does help to do a bit of background check in relation to institutions and personalities that are in the habit of giving so that you know if the motive is pure or somewhat questionable. And um, that's what informed my decision. In uh, your assessment, was the motive pure or questionable in this instance? Uh, the personality in question has, throughout the world, accumulated a questionable reputation in relation to the release of money by him directly or through his structures. So there was no point to even direct them or facilitate uh, some kind of a conversation between them and, say, Treasury, given um, the need that we have. So that, for you, was a no-go area. That, was, that didn't even arise. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the question you continue to exercise has, of course, uh, not stopped detractors from um, leveling all sorts of um, allegations against the judiciary. And this is a matter you raised very pointedly uh, when you released your annual report. Um, and in that particular instance, it was, of course, on the back of allegations that uh, some judges are corrupt and captured. Yes, um, it doesn't help making allegations, particularly against functionaries in an institution that has proven to be um, much needed when it matters the most without substantiation. That is why I did not say people should not make allegations. I said everybody who have evidence of corruption within the judiciary would have done all of us um, a lot of good by providing us with that evidence. And I went so far as to say just to avoid allegations that we have something to hide, share it with the public as you share it with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody has been forthcoming. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, who, who though do you think could be driving this narrative that judges are corrupt and captured? I, I think judges ought to be very careful not to speculate in the manner that the rest of the public is at liberty to do. Uh, I, would, I would rather veer off from speculating. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have, of course, asked, uh, directed that police be asked to investigate um, who these, these, these people are and where they could be coming from. Absolutely. It could be two-dimensional. It may well be that uh, somebody is either being malicious or actually does have proof of corruption without the judiciary but would not would want to come forward only if some protection is guaranteed to him or her that is why we have enlisted the services of the law enforcement uh, um, agency that has the necessary capacity to do the job well mm -hmm. uh, do you know if there has been any progress so far well it, it's uh, it's early days from from where i stand i mean we were informed i think was it last week or week before um, that the National Commission of Police has directed the Hawks to look into the matter. I think it would be to rush them a bit too much mm -hmm. to be expecting them to produce um, any, any tangible proof mm -hmm. by now. Now, uh, granted, uh, Chief Justice, I mean, those making uh, these claims may so far 
not have produced any any evidence but do they necessarily uh, deserve the title of sworn enemies of democracy as as you call them i think it does help to listen very carefully to what one says before it's either praised or criticized one way or the other. This is what I said. I said anybody who would gratuitously make allegations of corruption against the judges and fail to produce evidence even when called upon to do so can only be behaving in that manner because he or she is a son enemy mm -hmm. of our constitutional democracy. Mm -hmm. You ought to know, my brother, when you make such an allegation against the judiciary, that the confidence without which the judiciary cannot function, the public confidence that it has to enjoy to be effective in what it does, the confidence that necessitates compliance with the orders it makes, will, once it ceases to exist as a result of these allegations, our constitutional democracy is gone. And allow me just to wrap it up by saying, when it was extraordinarily difficult in this country, when it looked like the other arms of the state were not able to do what was required or expected of them to do, it took the judiciary to step in and, and, and make that difference that needed to be made at the, tower, at the hour of need. Now, if we're going to allow the judiciary to be damaged like that, gone is our constitutional democracy. That's the context. Now, two reasons, uh, uh, also to give you some context, uh, Chief Justice, that I ask this particular uh, question. One is, let's take the two cases um, you cited on the day. What? Um, the one uh, a complainant, um, you know, do you not think that it was a case of ignorance? No, about, it was. About how, things, it was. about how things work? I think it was. Yes. And then in the other case, could it not have been a case of, yes, bitterness um, at the fact that a, a, a ruling yes. once went against him? But, I mean, in those two cases, yes. can we really say that they are the enemies of no, democracy? No, no. Those are not the people I had in mind because... These are the people who are confident that what they have constitutes evidence of corruption within the judiciary. So confident they are that they provided us with the documentation. Mm -hmm. And all we are saying is, unlike these two people that we have criticized rightly so, I think, those that belong to the category of be looking like some enemies of our constitutional democracies are those who keep on heaping up allegations of corruption without the judiciary, mm -hmm. but even when asked to provide evidence that would back up their allegations, they don't do so. Mm -hmm. What would be the reason? Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, the, 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 the other, if we take it further, I mean, outside of the allegations of capture sure. and uh, corruption, and talk just about statements that have been made by people who should know better. If you take uh, the criticism of uh, uh, the judiciary by someone like the leader of the EFF, Julius Malema, or the criticism of the judiciary by a former minister and a prominent uh, business person in the name of uh, Trevor Manuel, for yes. example. Those statements do also contribute, uh, I mean, to um, or may contribute to what you say is actually undesirable because without the confidence of the people of South Africa yes. in the judiciary, then you're not going to be able to do what you correctly said is what the judiciary did yes. when we're in a very tight sport in yes. this country. Well, um, you know, th those statements, I believe, fall in the same category as statements that necessitated the convening of the meeting in 2015 when the judiciary was, uh, was facing similar attacks from members of the executive and some members of the ruling party. We understand then that when people are frustrated, sometimes without much reflection, they make statements which they later live to regret, as you would have seen from 
the apology that was tendered by one of the people who had made those statements. That is why my appeal on the 13th of September was leaders must reflect before they speak because their words carry more weight than the words of those who are not leaders. It was designed to be a caution to everybody who occupies a leadership position, including the two you have alluded to, to act with restraint, to come down before they make pronouncements about uh, constitutional institutions, including the judiciary. Mm. Now, you also are sort of coming closer to home, have uh, six cases of alleged conduct, uh, misconduct um, on the part uh, of uh, judges, and those are uh, yet uh, to, to, be, to be resolved. Can you give us an update on uh, where those are? Well, I can tell you that uh, <clears throat> We resolved the Motata matter today. Uh, the announcement will definitely be made uh, during the course of this week. We're just tidying up one or two things. Where he sits, he knows the outcome, but that one has been finalized. What we have done with uh, the second one relating to the reserve judgments was to take the decision or recommendation of the Judicial Conduct Tribunal that was chaired by former Constitutional Justice Person Kabinde to them to make representations in relation to that, uh, that recommendation. And it is only after receiving feedback from them that we would be able to take a final position. The only remaining matter, of course, uh, that is linked to them is that of a judge who has got a health challenge. Otherwise, it is that of Judge President Lope that is still before the Judicial Conduct Tribunal. And as I indicated um, at some, on, on some platform, there the challenge seems to be uh, legal fees of his legal representatives. It's something outside of the power of the judiciary. It's something that lies uh, within the, the, the hands of the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services. Well, unfair as it may have perhaps uh, be on uh, your part, but uh, while there is generally an acceptance that the mills tend to grind slowly um, when it comes to the uh, delivery of justice, uh, I mean, for many people, the Judge Lope matter, for instance, even the uh, Judge Mutata matter, sort of, uh, you know, gave credence to that perception um, uh, that when it comes to the judiciary, the, it's even more so. In other words, uh, the mills trying to grind even more slowly when it involves matters of uh, the judiciary. I, I think the, 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 the unfortunate part about that saga is this. Those who have the possibility to find out what the true position is before they disseminate information about these kind of matters made no effort to find out exactly what the problem was and whether there is an element of blameworthiness on the leadership of the judiciary in this regard. Let me practicalize it this way. It's more a question of your son getting 90% or 95% and if, uh, in all the, the subjects or courses that uh, he wrote on. And then you turn around and say, but let's look at the 5%. Why did you not uh, uh, get 100%? We have said that the overwhelming majority of cases of misconduct, even against me, were finalized expeditiously. So the situation that is being created, unfortunately, gives the, un the impression that we only had these three matters to deal with, and we have failed because we judged only on the basis of these matters. There hasn't been an attempt, as far as I know, to find out how many cases the Judicial the Conduct judge. Tribunal has disposed of against the judges. Nothing. Now, let's talk uh, then, uh, Chief Justice, about the several issues that uh, um, you raised that have an impact on uh, the work of the uh, judiciary. If we may start with uh, the uh, automate automation and development of modernization uh, systems because, I mean, our courts are still run uh, on a very manual uh, basis. Now, you started with this uh, pilot project, but in very real and practical terms, what is this project? What do you hope to get from this project? And what is it 
going to do to make your lives um, a lot easier? One of the major problems that the court system and the broader uh, justice system have encountered over the years is a disappearance of court records. It has been such an acute problem that <clears throat> in a number of cases, almost, I don't know whether it's a coincidence, but when an appeal is about to be lodged, the records would disappear. And when somebody wants to exercise his or her right to appeal, and the documentation that is necessary for the prosecution of the appeal is not available, invariably the outcome is going to be, well, the setting aside of the conviction and sentence. Now, that has harmed the institution. A reflection on how other jurisdictions got it right led us to court automation. They've got a storage capacity here, and there is another offside, with the result that even if you were to steal something here, which is very difficult, we still have backup. Even if the fire were to come and destroy, we still have backup elsewhere too. It's very expensive, particularly in cases where we need to have people inter, inter, uh, give evidence from abroad. To bring them in, it takes time, it takes a lot of money. Other jurisdictions have created the capacity to get evidence of a person in your courtroom while that person is in America. Two, filing of papers is costly, but with automation, people could be able to file their documents regardless of where in the world they are. Four, we would be able to create a platform that makes all our judgments accessible to our people, particularly uh, judicial officers, for free. We, could be, we would be able to create a platform for the public to have access to any information relating to, to our cases, to our court system, from wheresoever they are. So, so there are a number of benefits to be, to be derived from, from this system, and we have seen it work for other jurisdictions as well. It, it quickens the pace at which you process cases all the way through to uh, trial readiness, all the way through to, to finality. That is very difficult with a manual system. Now, uh, uh, what, is, what is the pilot project um, telling you, and how soon do you think you'll be able to roll it out? Well, the, the, the pilot project with the case lines with uh, e-filing, which we are running in Gauteen, because Gauteen seems to be where everything that matters is, is, is running well. We have struggled <clears throat> in the past with a, a server that is big enough to accommodate our needs. And two, it was not, uh, we never used to have the chief director uh, responsible for IT. Now we have a highly qualified person responsible for, for IT. And the little that we have been able to, to, to see uh, through the pilot project is that uh, this is something that has to that has to that is really going to make a lot of difference to the court system I'm not able to to put uh, time frames to it except to say that we are now we've now extended it to the Northwest province so we're running it both in Gauteng and in Northwest it is the the outcome of the experimentation that is going to dictate the date of readiness for the rollout. It's difficult when it has started not so long ago to be projecting yourselves into the future with the result that you are attracting unnecessary criticism. Sometimes we feel pressurized to look too optimistic without uh, satisfying your, yourself about the correctness of the promises you're making, only to be criticized. You said it is going to happen by such a date. What, what are you telling us now? So I'm not in a position to say by such and such a date. Has there been any cost attached to it? Well, uh, our cost in, uh, some two, three years ago was that 600 million rands. And uh, the <clears throat> colleague who is heading the committee responsible for court modernization, Judge President Lambo, says uh, he's not yet uh, in a position to give us the, the cumulative amount for the, for the rollout of the entire project. Now, will this automation and uh, modernization um, program deal with uh, what uh, you called the ever-increasing workload? 
It, it will, uh, coupled with two other projects that we are running, judicial case management and court annexed mediation. What we have realized and learned from jurisdictions like uh, the United States of America and Botswana that have implemented these programs is that most of the cases then gets final, uh, settled actually. 95% of the cases gets finalized um, and only 5% gets to go through, through trial. Why? Because all these technicalities that people tend to rely on to delay cases gets identified earlier, thrown out of the system, and those that, that, that do not have a solid case that to justify a trial then uh, settle because uh, the, the weaknesses of their cases would have been exposed. You're watching Nightline. We are in conversation with Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng. This conversation continues in a moment. Don't go.